Hello and welcome to This Week in VonDB. This is a show that looks at some of the latest vulnerabilities from open source ecosystems. And today we have, well, I'm going to say the most scariest one, but I always say that and it's always the more scary one. Anyway, we actually have some uh, some demos today too, which is kind of cool. But um, my name is Developer Steve. I'm one of the senior developer advocates at Sneak. And I'm joined here today by my co-host, Vendana. Hello, Vendana. Hello, Steve. How are you? Good morning. Good. How how are you going? Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending where uh, everyone is. And well, good morning. Uh, good morning to you, Vendetta. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you excited to go through some funds? I always love looking at the code level side of these just to see like how, like how they've surfaced. And uh, actually, the, Ed, I know we were talking about this just before we went live, but um, I've got one of the most scariest ones I've seen. Actually, let me rephrase that. I've got one of the what scariest, most scariest ones I've seen in the PHP ecosystem today. Oh. So, um, do you want to show it to hopefully, me? Hopefully, I, I do. I do. But I, I thought I'd, let's go through some of the some of the ones first. Um, just before we do, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to DevSecOn, our good friends at the DevSecOn um, communities or the global community uh, who have a conference uh, happening, uh, well, they did in a few months, but their CSP is now open. So I was just going to pop that into the chat. There we go. Uh, if you've got an amazing talk you want to share um, a, or CFP you want to sum, uh, submit, then please check out that link uh, and, um, yeah, get that submitted away as well. Just blocking some spam. There we go. Um, yeah, but the CFP is uh, is open at the moment for DevSecOn 24. Um, oh, these fan bots, seriously. <laughs> there we go. Put them in jail. Put them in timeout. This is fine now. Um, but yeah, the DevSecOn 24 uh, CFP is now open. So if you've got uh, some some tips or some um, techniques that you wanted to share with uh, the DevSecOn community and you know, geek out uh, with DevSecOps style talks then please check that out. Tickets are free and um, they, the proceeds, well, the, the tickets are free, but we actually donate um, to some really amazing charities. So really worth checking out. Anyway, let's uh, let's have a look. I'm gonna do the screen share thing. Hey, there we go. It's working. Uh, this is a good start because I'm going to do a fun demo in a little bit. Anyway, um, this is the security, the, the sneak, security VUN database. So let me share the link to that. Now, as a developer, one thing I always uh, like doing with this is, well, I actually do check this every day when I'm drinking my morning coffee. There we go, put the link into the chat. Oh, and I can also put it on screen. Let me share that one, there we go. That's what we're currently looking at right now. So if you want to have a look too, then um, please open it up. And also, if you are watching live, please drop the uh, any comments, questions, or emojis into the chat, and we'd be happy to, well, I'm happy to read those out or highlight them on the screen. Um, also, you can join the, uh, the DevSecOn community as well. I'll put the link for that up on the screen. And we're always happy to, uh, well, to get feedback or just chat about some of the ones that we're going to be talking about today. Or if you've got one that you want to see highlighted, right, please add that to, uh, well, any of the aforementioned in the chat or on the on the Discord as well. Oh, I've got to get that link. See, I have all these links ready to go, and then I have to, like, grab them out of the document. Anyway, I'm putting that link into the chat now too, so please join us on Discord if you want as well. So let me let's go through the vulnerability database for this week. Uh, anything jumping out there for you, Vendana? I can see a lot of vulnerabilities, which have been repeating for a very, very long time, right? Like yeah. pollution, and then I could see some on the top as well, arbitrary file upload. Improper verification of cryptographic signature. That's almost a tongue twister. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a look at that one. That's from the Maven ecosystem. Oh, my screen yeah. is bigger. There we go. WebJar for NodeForge. Uh, we can also view that. I'll open that now. 
uh, improper verification of cryptographic signature. What can you tell us about that one from a security point of view for that security type? Then, Dana? I don't know why people use a very low security when it comes to the cryptographic storages or signatures. We have so many mm. um, new versions of it. People talk about that uh, when there is a new signature or new algorithm that has come, it has come with certain capabilities, certain security measures. And here, what we are doing is even um, not just signatures, but a lot of places we are still using the low algorithm or lower algorithm. Now, what happens is that if I am using, let's say, see, if you th see this one, it, it, this talks about RSA PKS um, 1, and it's using V1.5 signature verification. Now, there are updates which are available. There are updated versions which are available. Why aren't we using that? Right? And that's, it is going to help us. Be it our signatures, be it algorithms, be it hashes that we use. Let's use these updated versions. And even uh, this seems to be an issue a lot of places. Even uh, when we talk about OWASP top 10, OWASP top 10 also touches this area where it needs to have proper cryptographic alg algorithm. Now, when we want our data to be secure, must, why are we using a lower algorithm? Right, Steve? Yeah, I, I agree. Especially like, um, I mean, most common usages, uh, usages, <laughs> use cases for, um, for like um, encrypting things are either going to be for user sessions, like for authentication or even encrypting data, user passwords, like this is all high critical um, functionality inside, well, inside any app, because I mean, they, from a developer point of view, well, from any part of the SDLC, like these users and users put so much trust in the, the work that we do to try and protect not only them, but build out an amazing app. So, right. um, yeah. And especially if your app doesn't verify the cryptographic signatures itself, how critical that would be, right? You can't verify who is trusted, who is not trusted. It's, it's a big concern. Let's say I say um, that you are a malicious person, but you are a trusted person or you are a trusted person. And I feel that there is a problem. So there is no proper verification for spoofing and all those um, integrity checks, which can be there. So there has to yeah. be a proper verification. Yeah, I agree. And especially just taking the time to not only scan your app and find this sort of stuff ongoingly, not even just the initial offset, but um, just, pr again, protect those end users because they put so much trust in the stuff we build out for their, you know, keeping them safe. Yeah. Um, and think of a certain files. If, let's say, um, there are certain files which are uh, uploaded and which have issues, how would you deal with that? Or um, now when I was talking about OWASP top 10, it has come to top two list. Now, how scary that would be these cryptographic failures, we can understand. And it has never been like on the top earlier. Now these issues are creeping up because we are seeing that there are issues. There are people who are not able to validate the risks or mitigate the risks which are there. And it is exhaustive, whatever we say that. And any given weakness may, may create issue. And that's why we need to understand these issues, that what we have in our environment and validate it properly. Yeah, I agree. I just realized too, this one actually appears a number of times in a few different ecosystems, so NPM and also in Maven. So it's yeah. always interesting to see the flow on from that. NPM, Maven, Java, it is appearing in any ecosystem that we talk about. And see, based on the ecosystem, it is changing. If you see, there are certain medium level vulnerabilities, low level vulnerabilities, and then it suddenly creeps up to be a high severity issue. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it totally does. Yeah. Um, there's another one. Oh, here it is. Um, the classic cross-site scripting attack. And I say classic because it's one that we just see, well, we, we've seen a, a multiple times, haven't we, Verdana? Yeah. And, and cross-site scripting has always been my uh, one of my favorites because 
it's not part of top 10 anymore because it's clubbed with injection but still people see this and how it happens it's when an application take input from the user in the form of a script doesn't validate it and replicate it or just show it to the user or print it to the user now if i want some task to be done from the server i would be able to get it done and the fun fact if there if the application is vulnerable it can impact multiple users right it can impact a huge set of user whosoever comes i remember yeah. there was a blog where um, these uh, th this was vulnerable and somebody posted that um, th all the cookies would be sent to the person server and and that used to mm -hmm. happen or install malware or ransomware or a backdoor so that becomes scary but then uh, people have been trying to fix it but still these issues are coming up whatever uh, validations we have in place people are able to bypass them so these validations yeah. are a big thing that we need to take care of that's where the issues are getting started off or security misconfigurations that we see these days actually this is interesting because there's not only cross site scripting but there's a remote code execution and i think the the two being related i mean is no coincidence because yeah the cross site scripting alone i think you touched on it there too is it literally allows you know um, malicious content to be loaded into your or malicious input to be loaded onto your website into your app and then from there um and you you did talk about that too which is you know once you've injected something into that app then it's either going to be surface to the user or well it's going to do bad things on the server <laughs> yeah. um, what's this is this one in particular i found interesting from the dev side because this is actually a WYSIWYG editor so and this allows like in blogs or um, user generated interaction to allow a end user to add formatted content which automatically outputs as html and this gets really tricky from the developer sanitizing input and always in always we always sanitize input can't stress this one enough so important um, but yeah, this allows um, uh, non-tech users to be able to edit content and say it just saves as HTML. So, and yeah, in this instance, like this one is quite extensively used, 46,000 downloads a week, which is, um, that's, that's a lot of usage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a huge amount of usage. And so, yeah, usually you see these things, these type of, um, these type of uh, packages used in blogs or, anywhere that there's user-generated content, so, uh, social media networks as well, where you'll have input go in. Oh, there's an example there. Um, oh, no, that's the example for the the, 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 the usability. But, yeah, it, this editor, super handy because end users don't need to know HTML. They can just build stuff like hit, um, hit bold or, you know, format content, and then it just comes straight out. So um it look actually looks like there's a fix for this one too which is to update to the latest version which we can see there so the latest version is clear of vulnerabilities which um is amazing to see because shout out to that community for uh fixing that vulnerable and get, like getting a new release out really quickly um anyway let's go back to yeah. there's and one steve if you go up yeah. i could see ssrf as well Ooh, on the yeah. go one? Oh, this is a go yeah. one. Yeah, let me open that one. That's um, so what can you tell us about SRSF? <gasps> no patch. <gasps> <laughs> I'm scared already. <laughs> no, no, no. But let me tell you what exactly it is. So server side request forgery, which we call it as SSRF. It's a new addition in the top 10. Now, earlier, uh, so this is not a new vulnerability. I remember seeing it in 2015 as well, when I learned about it. But then it has been there for a very, very long time. But now it has got its place in OWASP Top 10. Why I'm talking about it, people look for OWASP Top 10 issues. That's why. Now, SSRF vulnerability. This vulnerability particularly let an attacker send any crafted message from, the, uh, from their end to the backend server. And for example, now 
I remember uh, there's one breach with one of the banks wherein the person could upload the credit card picture. Now, while they were uploading the credit card picture, there was a URL. Now, in the URL, if I change the picture URL to something else, it was processing. That was funny. Why server was reacting? Server was only supposed to take a picture. Now, if let's say I upload cat picture, that was uploaded. Now, instead of that, the malicious person or the attacker, they actually tried to do some recon, fetch some data from the server because we are trying to forge the server. So uh, they put in the IP for AWS because that's a standard 169 IP with fetching the metadata. And the metadata was fetched. Then they wanted to fetch IAM credentials. And that was fetched because the, the, there were some folders there. Under oh. IAM, what would I need? SSH and access keys. They were given with the region. Now, what else do I need to log into any AWS account? I have the access keys. I have the SSH keys. I have the uh, region. I have all the access that I need. Or if I able to, if I am able to scan the server, their IPs, internal IPs, I can fetch. How cool that would be for me! So server side request re request forgery generally um, happen when an attacker has full or partial control of the request sent by the web application. So it could be where third party URL or um, when there's a request that's being made to the server in very simple terms. Yeah, um, yeah. while you were saying that, I was actually looking through the code and exactly what you just said, literally that was the fix was, yeah, they've um, validated, done better validation on the uh, on the host names. So um, yeah, this is, I mean, the scary part here is, and like I've been here before, well, not here, here, but some things that I've deployed in the past, like onto infrastructure that the company that I've deployed it for, like is paying for, um, attacker remote attacker or malicious actor gets access to the server and then all sorts of nasty things start happening and you get that really big bill at the end of the month and you're like it shouldn't be doing that why is it doing that and you have to try and identify like what the issue is so um, actually i'm going to i'm going to start that community because you could see like everyone pulling together to you know get these fixes out and get a release happening and this this particular package looks to be pretty well used it's been forked four and a half thousand times and there's a thousand people watching it plus it has 38,000 stars so um, I always love seeing the communities come together to fix this stuff super quick and working together to you know get get stuff patched um, yeah. that's always amazing to see yeah and and why do you want to control the date why do you let the control in the hands of the user especially around URLs mm. I know that there, there, there is a data that is needed but at the same time, if we can validate the URLs as well, and if I am an attacker and I have access to that, uh, I would be able to change the URL parameter to localhost and try and scan it, try and bypass white IP whitelisting, abuse the trust which is there, perform port scans and recon the server. And I would love to try and read the files which are there on the server or delete them. Yeah. I would yeah. love that. Yeah. As a... Um... Yeah, especially like once you've got that that one little tiny crack in the, it, we always describe it as an iceberg, that one, one very little crack in the top of the iceberg and you just get into the, the full iceberg stack, if you will. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, let's have a look. There was another one I saw when I was scanning the list this morning. Um, it's a few pip ones or Python ones. Um, Wait, what is this one? HTTP request smuggling. What's that security type? Hmm. Oh, that's an interesting one. So HTTP oh. request smuggling is basically is basically a technique where um, we can, as an attacker, I can interfere into HTTP request and uh, I can modify and send it. So request smuggling vulnerabilities are uh, generally very critical because the security controls can be bypassed. If you are a user and I can smuggle your request, so I, can, I am bypassing security controls and gaining the unauthorized access to the server. So how cool that would be. Like it used to happen wow. wherein there are front-end servers, back-end servers, and um, 
when the front end server forward the request to the http request to the back end server it typically sends multiple requests then which we see on the browser and the proxy because generally with naked eyes we can't see it on the browser so we use proxy for that all right so this is similar to um the man in the middle attack where it's able to hijack Oop, i think uh I think Vendan has been redirected. <laughs> this is similar to the. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, um, so this is similar to a man in the middle attack where it kind of almost hijacks the user's session or hijacks the the server request and is able to send it somewhere completely different where malicious things can happen essentially. Or I can just sniff it and I can just go ahead and change it to something else, right? I would be able yeah. to send those bad messages, uh, ambiguous messages to the places, right? To the server. And server would ed entertain that. Like if the backend server is able to entertain that, then I can do anything. Like literally anything. Yeah, OK. Well, yeah, and, um, I mean, one of the, uh, I guess, countermeasures for this is similar to a, um, a what are they called, the cause request, where you know, a core origin where it knows that uh, well, the server and browser know that certain things like assets, images have to come from a certain URL. This kind of circumvents that in a, in a way. Right. And see, um, one thing is that when we have these, uh, when we are using load balances, when we are using CDNs or even reverse proxies, right. so we, that has to be set up properly. Because if you're using the, them, then it's easy to do these kind of attacks because the, the data is being cached and a lot of it has been used in the backend. Now, also, if we can use the connection again from the backend server, it is easy to replicate these HTTP request smuggling because um, I can modify the request. I can actually, technically, if I don't disable it, I can replicate these requests. But yes, if I disable the reuse on the backend server, then I would completely prevent these HTTP request smuggling. And on top of it is that, um, why would I need to expose all the traffic? There's, there are H HSTS and multiple other things that are there. And even uh, we try and say that, let's use WAF, Web Application Firewall, so that we can detect if there's any malicious activity which is happening, if somebody is trying to smuggle HTTP requests, or modify the content header or try and play around with the headers. We can, we can, yeah. that's what web, web, web application firewalls are for. Let's go ahead and check them out. Uh, the WAF, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me grab. Uh, it's a five. Probably, oh, there we go. Let's go to Wikipedia. Just well, oh, that loaded wow. super super quick. Um, so yeah, that's the um, and yeah, I've deployed um, web web application firewalls before, like to production, to be able to do exactly what you just said, like to, to try and be able to sanitize um, sanitize requests coming through and really add that nice layer of protection again to protect my end users because I love them. <laughs> Spend so much time building out the app to try and you know get people in. You know you you really want to make sure you're protecting their session and their um, their logins, like anything that they're interacting with inside the application itself. So yeah, and I know. Um, oh wow, look at all the threats listed on here. Yeah, and and let me Ooh. pitch in OWASP here as well. So OWASP um, has core rule set, which goes very well handy with mode security, um, WAF, and you can use the rule set with uh, mod security and you can apply and you can test it out. How good that would, would, would be for you to, to start off. Now I'll tell you, I am not against any commercial tool, but my way is that let's understand our appetite. What do we have? Use open source first and understand what is missing. What are the things we need? And those things, when you have written it down, what you need and what more you need then go with the commercial vendor because i have seen my friends buying those tools and uh, leaders buying those commercial assets but then they're not using it because that's not useful for the environment it's good for other people doesn't mean it's good for you 
So WAF is something like that, that let's use it based on our need, have the right set of rules so that it is useful. That makes sense. Also, I love that they've actually linked to the Wikipedia page that I was just on here as well. Um, anyway, totally worth checking out, uh, especially if you're looking for one or if you've got one and you just want to review, uh, like Vandana was saying, if you just want to do the review on, you know, is this the right tool? Should, you know, should I be using something else or have I, am I using it in the right way? Um, and always good to do those periodic reviews because, well, as we all know, the industry changes amazingly fast, like the lightning speed. Uh, and it is good to have these things. It is good to have web, web application firewalls to understand who's trying to play around our application. We can figure out these attacks early. Um, there's one here that, um, uh, so just to jump to back to the list again, but, um, there's one here that I, I mean, I, I'm, I always see certain, um, security vulnerability types like, you know, denial of service or cross-site scripting. I always see these new ones pop up like improper neutralization of formula elements in a CSS file. And this is one that's appeared in PIP today. Um, have you seen this one before then, Donna? Hmm. Seems to be a different one. Let's go ahead and get into it. Improper. So is it? Yeah. Nice Gradio. Time. So this this particular package for the the Python ecosystem. So from the from the pip managers package manager, uh, but it's a Python library for easy easily interacting with trained machine learning models. This is interesting because I think we were talking about this last uh, episode too. Is there's more. Um, there's a lot of TensorFlow and um, data engineering or data sciences uh, vulnerabilities starting to appear now. And mm. this looks like it's another one. Yeah, right. The commit. Ah, serialized flagging of inputs. Ah, we were just talking about this with cross-site scripting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, um, so yeah. essentially what this looks like is this is a machine learning or a tool used in the machine learning world. And Python like has an amazing, uh, amazingly rich load of uh, sort of data engineering tool sets for doing a lot of um, data analysis and machine learning, artificial intelligence stuff. And this looks like one of those sub tools used by some of those tool sets to, well, import a CSV. And this is something I know we've, talked about doing is like a data engineering vulnerability demo. And this is, well, this is basically that. Uh, so this is uh, a CSV being imported into a machine learning engine and it's not sanitizing the data on input. So there's a lot of assumptions, like I spent 10 years as a data analyst, there's a lot of assumptions made on the data sets being sanitized and cleaned before they kind of reach analytical tools. And yeah. this actually, this vulnerability has surfaced sort of in that um, in the, in that category as well of like it needs to be sanitized on the way in, otherwise it, the mm -hmm. the tool sets become vulnerable, which is right. really interesting. Again, it's a yeah, and again, it's a sanitization issue, right? Uh, yeah. Wherein, let's say, if I'm a user and I am sending data to the web application and it's getting stored somewhere in the database, and when I download it in an SV csv file and it doesn't validate so if i can put in some malicious data it would be downloaded do you think is that the one yeah this is the one well yeah and particularly because a lot of the uh data sets that uh, data science folks will be using a lot of them will have come from some type of user input and they're trying to do some analytics to understand either user behavior or um, maybe how a user interacted with a with a bot or with some type of chatbot type um, system. So they've entered malicious input like cross-site scripting stuff or uh, in stuff, input data that is malicious. And then this basically is allowing it to go straight into the machine learning tools and do all sorts of malicious activity inside that. This is literally, um, and I mean, the demo, oh, the demo I always, I always wanted to do for this was... Um, around a chatbot and call it stop hacking yourself because you can mm -hmm. basically ask a, a chatbot to literally, you know, malicious, do malicious activity on itself, which is interesting. Absolutely. You're very right. If a chatbot is there and I don't 
um, I don't I don't have a proper validation for the chat bot. I can like as an attacker, I can go ahead and put in anything and try and fetch as much as information I can or ask a chat bot to do malicious tasks. That'll do my work. If not yeah. database information, but I can impact many other users which are coming to the website. Yeah, it starts to get um, really scary because I know this is also all this came up at a number of conferences, uh, security conferences of that last year too, which is using uh, machine learning and AI to start to do malicious activity on their own. <laughs> this is yeah. literally straight out of the Terminator movies. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, let me scroll down. Now, there's a couple of really interesting ones on this page. I'm going to come back to this one because there's one more I wanted to wanted to talk about. Um, one of my favorite. Oh, there it is. So we've started um, started getting a lot of these unmanaged uh, ecosystem um, libraries and functionality come in. And one in particular caught my eye because this is Lua. Now, I like Lua. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. And if you are, please drop it in the chat or you know, drop it on Discord, which we are monitoring. So if you are there, please put your comments, emojis, like whatever it is. But Lua is like, it's a, it's an old language. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, actually, I'm not going to call it old. I'm going to say it's been around a while. And it's one of those versatile language sets that it gets used by, um, usually by, uh, it gets used by games to do extension thing, like a game extensions. You can build like fun little modules and things. But also um, there was a, I was using it a number of years ago to do cross-site mobile um, app building in a, um, a platform called, I think it was, I think it's still called this, but um, Corona SDK, which is a cross-platform mobile app development um, platform. And it was, it was written in Lua. Lua was great. It was you know, um, easy to use. You could build stuff out really quickly. You could use functions. Like, it was pretty cool. Um, so this particular vulnerability is the sandbox bypass. Again, I haven't seen this one before, but um, well, have you seen this one? Or what can you tell, tell us about this one from the security side of things? Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, Lua is something which I'm hearing for the first time, but uh, that's a good information about it. And uh, let's talk a bit about Sandbox Bypass, because this seems to be a critical issue, which is there in the application where um, uh, people can bypass the sandbox of the whole ecosystem itself and can get the direct access to host objects. But now think of it in a very, very simple terms is that like we have a shell and we are able to bypass that shell. So how crazy that would be. And these uh, sandbox bypass issues are very common these days where people are able to um, bypass and can inject anything in that. And on top of it, now when we are talking about these older applications and if we have on-prem and cloud applications which are merged and I'm able to bypass on-prem application, Will there be a problem? Absolutely. There will be a lot of issues, a lot of crazy things that will be there. Actually, this kind of goes back to what you were saying too before with the um, the, the, the cage poisoning, or well, this one actually does T-cage poisoning, T-cage bin poisoning, which um, is also associated to a use after free vulnerability as well. Um, but yeah, going back to what you were saying about the cache, like your server cache is to make sure that it's secured and make sure that you know nothing can, nothing well, no vulnerability can exploit it and, or no malicious tactic can ex exploit the vulnerability and be able to do nasty things on your server because, well, nobody likes that at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I can actually uh, manipulate the things, then it is easy for me to do anything and any, everything. And again, it again goes back to or zero down to the validations. Uh, let me close that one. Um, should we go back to the, that was the end of that page. Wait, Q uh, I want to look at that one, but um, I know we haven't got long left and I know there was one, uh, oh, sales. Oh, that's from NPM. Anyway, see, I always find this interesting because every time I look through, there's always like something new to have a look at. But I did want to have a look at the this one. 
is literally the scariest vulnerability I've ever seen in the PHP ecosystem. And I've experienced like rootkits before on WordPress installs, which is a whole pain because cleaning up those sites are, oh, anyway, that's probably a whole episode itself. But DOMP PDF is probably the big one for the month. Wait, I think I have a sound effect this one. Hang on. So we went 30 minutes without me playing a sound effect this one, this episode. Oh, yes. <laughs> anyway, this one is really bad, and I'm going to explain why, because I actually wrote a blog post too, which I'll, I'll put in at the end of this, and we're gonna, I'm going to demo it because I built this into our PHP goof app already. So everyone can try it themselves at home. Remember, don't take this app to production. This is for development and testing uh, purposes only. So please try it at home. Don't try it in production, whatever you do. Even if you're using this in production, please don't use it in production. <laughs> no, um, I'll actually talk about, talk through how this works, what it does from the PHP side of things, and then how you can mitigate it until there's a fix released. Because currently there is no fix, but what this library does is uh, basically PDF generation on the fly which is really cool because um, like I've been writing PHP for many, many years now and PDF creation along with image generation is probably two of my least favorite tasks right next to um, mail template generating as well. So, and PDFs uh, as uh, I'm sure everyone uh, is probably either aware or can imagine is used for, well, a lot of e-commerce stuff because you've got, uh, receipts and um, invoices that can be generated from transaction data, essentially. There's many other uses, but that's kind of one of the most common use cases uh, in particular to, you know, e-commerce applications. And why this one's really bad is this one in particular has been around many, many years. So this is the PHP Composer um, uh, ecosystem page. And so DOM PDF has, well, it's got 47,000 and a whole bunch of numbers, but 47,000 million installs since it initially launched in 2014. It's been around since 2013, but it, it came onto um, Composer package aced uh, ecosystem in 2014. But it's nearly got 50 million installs. And if we have a look at the dependencies, so these are other projects that are using this particular package as a, as a dependency. PHP Office, which is for creating spreadsheets, has 66 million downloads. So this particular vulnerability is in a lot of other packages as well because, well, it's cool functionality. And, you know, shout out to that community for um, the Don P PDF community for not only keeping it going but extending it over so many years. It's got quite the following on GitHub as well. Um, this particular vulnerability, though, allows me to, it's kind of a combo one. So it does say remote code execution, but to do that, I have to kind of do a cross-site scripting attack to be able to get the RCE loaded onto someone's server to do something nasty. And it's actually really easy to do, which is even more scary. Um, anyway, I have a demo. So I have built this into our PHP goof app. Um, but did you want to talk a bit about remote code execution first? Because, I, I mean, wait, I think I need to play the music again. Remote code execution. There we go. <laughs> this, this one, like, from developer or DevOps point of view, like, really scares me because this lets anyone do really nasty things to my server, doesn't it? Yeah, and all, to my absolutely. App. And I totally love it. I totally love it, to be very candid. This is something which interests me the most because I'm going to showcase a demo today around our CE itself, which is remote code execution. So if I am an attacker, I can run any code, any arbitrary code on a remote device. Could be your server. And if I can do it, that means I can perform an injection. I can perform deserialization attacks or even like there are issues with out of band attacks where we talk about server side request forgery. I can go ahead and do those out of bound attacks. And if I can inject uh, remote code into your server, I can fetch any information. I can post or deploy an application or to be very candid, a file. Like with log4j, we were able to do it. 
and the demo which i was talking about to you uh, what was that python rce vulnerability python remote code execution in celery so that was interesting yeah. one so we should yeah i love that, that. are you go 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 ahead steve let's go ahead and uh, see the demo i was going to say i read that blog that celery blog too and and the video that you did and yeah i yeah I uh, I also got cold cold shivers from that one too. Dun dun dun. <laughs> um, I should have played it, but I'm like three screens away from the soundboard, so I need to get some buttons. Anyway, um, so this particular to start. So I've basically built this already into the PHP Goof app, and I'm going to put the link to that in the chat. So if anyone wants to try it themselves, please feel free. Also, if you want to add add a vulnerability type to it, uh, reach out. Uh, well, you can, uh, it's publicly available on GitHub, so always up for pull requests, but also uh, reach out to me on socials or in the chat here or on our Discord as well. So always up for adding new ones. Uh, in particular, so I have a list of vulnerabilities here, including PHP Mailer, which um, been pretty clear for a while. There's a, usually a few associated with that, that one. But um, this new one, as you can see, I've already added the, the page and also a, a blog post for it. But what this new one does is, um, so DOM PDF uh, library allows me to add uh, HTML, have HTML, straight HTML convert into a PDF file. Amazingly handy, used by a whole bunch of the ecosystem to create PDFs on the fly. One of the things you do with HTML is through CSS is style the HTML. So make it look really nice, have a nice background, like do some really fun things with it. Have a custom font, which is where this one comes in. So inside CSS, you can or custom style sheets or cascading style sheet, or custom. I mean, it's kind of custom, but you can have font families so what that looks like normally, let me make that a bit bigger, is you have a font family name inside CSS. So it's just loaded in through font face. And then you can link to, you can either link to or name a particular font that you want to use. So in this instance, we're actually linking to this gotcha font file, but it's not a regular font file. Like font files are normally OFTs or TTF files. This is a PHP file. We'll get into that. So as part of this exploit, what I've done is, or how it works, is you create a custom font type. So and normally font font files or font types are literally just like a bunch of, this is the Arial one I've got already got loaded here. You have a whole bunch of information about how the font needs to be displayed, what it looks like, like all its characteristics. Pretty straightforward. So this is Arial. You can see there you can all the, got all the Unicode to basically tell like how it needs to be displayed to describe how it needs to work essentially. And in this line here, so as part of the meta of the font file, you have a license and you have like all the information or the copyright, all the information about that particular font style. In our malicious font, what we're actually doing, this is where it gets super interesting, is I've got font file here now this is loaded into the into the goof app as well in the exploits folder so if we take a look at that one you can see here i've got gotcha hyphen normal dot oft that's what i called it i created a custom font for this which is actually really easy to do it's the first time i've ever created one so it was surprisingly easy to do and inside our font file uh didn't go oh, i loaded the wrong one hang on let me grab the one I prepared earlier. There we go. So this is the gotcha, gotcha normal. It's called font file. And I, as you can see, there's no characters in this at all. I removed all the characters because I didn't need them like that. That's I didn't need any of them at all. So I took them all out because I literally just needed a shell file. Um, and as you can see, the name is called gotcha normal. The style is called normal, and that's it. There's no. It's designed by. There's no manufacturer until we get to the copyright. Now in the copyright, I've got uh, like our normal PHP open, close tags, what we normally put into PHP files, and then a PHP dot or PHP info. And what this does on PHP ecosystem, for those that don't know, is it'll actually output all the details from the server 
like everything, all the extensions loaded, all the pathways, like everything. We'll see what that looks like. Although I am going to be giving away a whole bunch of information about my Mac. But anyway, we'll see what that looks like. Now, as part of the remote code execution, you could literally have anything you wanted in here. I could dump the database, like I could do a shell exe, like whatever I wanted to do, I could put it in there. And this is super important because we're going to get our server to run this by literally by loading a PDF, which is really scary. Anyway, so the, we've got our font file. Now what we do with the font file is we load it into, we copy the contents of it out into a, a, a PHP file. So this is literally the, the output from that font, the, that OFT, that gotcha font OFT. And I've copied it into gotcha underscore font dot PHP. Super critical as well for this to work because this is essentially how that particular, this bit here, that php.info, we're going to run that on the server remotely, which is the remote code execution part of things, side of things. So what we then do is we need to generate a PDF. So inside our goof app, I've set, set up DOM PDF the way it should be used. So I, I can create a to-do item called, this is a to-do item. And that'll create a nice little line entry like that. So, and this little icon on the end here, I, all these little icons, I can do things like edit, delete. I can send an email to someone. That's for the mail, the PHP mailer um, vulnerability. So if I click on the PDF, it opens in a new window and it creates a PDF like so, which is pretty simple. I can do all the regular PDF things with that. I can download it and print it, whatever else. So for this particular vulnerability to work, and I've got this on the readme on the PHP goof app, if I click back down to that, I've already got the line here to use as part of the injection. So let me copy, actually, I already added it to there. There we go. It's probably easy to read. So what it does is this is straight CSS that you would normally include on a HTML page. It's just linking to the style sheet to do some HTML styling. But if we add that line, as a to-do item, we can actually inject that into the server. So I'm going to add that as a to-do. And so far, like it hasn't done anything yet. And this won't work until it actually generates the PDF. So normally the way these PDFs generate is it sends it over as either a, a get item or as a post item over to the generate page, or it's just, you know, generates uh, basically from, from the database uh, input. So as you can see in the, or you may not be able to see it in the title, but in the title, it's got php.php, question mark, title equals, and then this is a to-do item, and then it just outputs on the page. I thought I'd keep it really simple for this one. So that line that we've just injected now, if I click on PDF, it will basically use that to create a PDF page. There's actually a bug I need to fix in this. There we go. And as you can see here, it now says gotcha hack. So we've actually just created our vulnerability uh, on the server. We haven't executed it yet. So what's happening inside that pdf.php page is it's running all the DOM PDF functions that you would normally expect it to do. It's basically so straight off their tutorial. It's just creating a new PDF, setting up a basic HTML page, to then output any of the content that's sent over through that get request. It will then use that to generate the PDF straight out. So in this instance, that particular line that I've just injected, it's essentially grabbed a CSS file with a custom font style. Actually, it links that file straight from the GitHub demo page, as you can see there. It's then loaded the font file straight from the, the GitHub, and then it stores the font inside a font cache and so all I have to do now is execute that PHP remotely. And what I've set up inside that particular um, PHP page is if it detects this font as being available, and I'm actually using the DOM PDF library to do this, like to grab the, grab the list of fonts that it's got cached. And if it's available, then it just links to wherever the font name is straight from the library. So strip, that way it can, it's easier to kind of spot. So, and we can see that there, there it is there. It's created two files. So it's created gotcha underscore normal and then like a string of like a hash string, U UFM, which is the font file, but it's also created a .php file at the same time. 
And this is basically one of the failings of this particular library as far as this vulnerability goes. So now if I click that gotcha hack link, it will open the php.info we included in our font file. And again, this could be literally anything I wanted in that particular um, in that particular copyright area or in that metadata, it will automatically output and run, execute that PHP code. And so now I have all the server information. I probably don't want to scroll too far because this is literally my local environment. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is this is literally the vulnerability. This is how it works. Ta-da. Also, yay, it worked. Oh, there was no doubt. I, I tinkered with yeah. this last week a lot to get it running. This seems to be very cool. And I totally love it. And I'm I was just downloading the whole repo and I was trying it myself because this is amazing. And these remote code execution bugs are like so interesting, so fascinating to see. And like there are so many new things that keep creeping up, right? Every week we talk about remote code execution. And now while we talk about that, like in our morning shows, every week there is a remote code execution and we're talking about it and we're still seeing it. We, we, we would go old, our kids would grow up and we would still see these issues. How cool that it's would true. be. It's true. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe there'll be quant quantum remote code executions <laughs> by then. <laughs> maybe. I was talking about quantum this morning with Kyle. <laughs> Hacker Kyle. Oh my god! <laughs> um, but there, yeah, that's the. I, so this vulnerability right now is on a lot of server infrastructure, like anything running PHP. Which last time I checked the stats was like seventy nine percent of backends on the internet use PHP as a as a language. But there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, sites that'll be using this as you know, for doing PDF generation. Um, so yeah, if you are using it, please, uh, there is no patch yet. So there's some ways that you can actually mitigate this though, until the, until a release comes out or until a library release comes out. Uh, so one is, um, that font cache, uh, location, like make it right make it readable only don't make it writable. And that way that particular function will not work because it, it can't save the file. It's just literally just going to error. Oh. oh. I was like, where did my screen go? <laughs> <laughs> I've been remote code executed. <laughs> that's what happened on the live that's, channel, right? That's, yeah, that's what happens. Um, so yeah, make that inside the composer, inside the DOM PDF uh, library location for composer, make that font in, uh, where is it? DOM PDF lib fonts, make that file, make that folder readable only. And that way that font won't cache can't happen. Uh, the other option is to move, and this is highly recommended as well, is to move your composer folder away from being publicly available. So there's less chance of that remote code execution. If it was me, uh, I'm not actually, I'm pretty sure I'm not using this anywhere. I would literally just do the, uh, the font, um, like make that font folder uh, readable only, like remove write access until the patch comes out. Now there is a, um, and we actually talk about it. There it is. A fix was pushed into master branch, but not yet published. So there is a fix coming, but it's not yet released. So um, something to be aware of in the PHP ecosystem. Anyway, if you want to share screen, uh, did you want to do, you want to do a fun demo? <laughs> <laughs> now this goof will, I'll always be remembering. I was just trying to keep it down so that I have it ready before, like bef uh, before I start uh, and you finish everything. And suddenly my screen pops. I'm like, what happened? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you tried to do a uh, yeah. You're totally doing a live stream RCE. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I will right. take my screen off. Um, oh, wait, I'll is, is this that fast. Is yeah, this the celery one? Oh yes. No, I it? love it. Oh, amazing. Maybe I'm getting in love with Python a lot these days. <laughs> Python is cool. I like Python. I've, yeah. well, I've used it for ga game development before. Like it's such an extendable language, extensible language, um, widely used uh, throughout from for so many different things. Like I love Python. Yeah, I, I even I have started to love it the way it is. 
but there are a few vulnerabilities i think that can creep up in any ecosystem and uh, we need to just take care of it now let me go ahead and share my screen and i hope you can see my screen now what i'm trying to do with this particular vulnerability is that so this particular vulnerability was based on the hypothesis but then the hypothesis was tested and figured out yes the vulnerability is it exists so i'm using a linux ecosystem or one to here and i have a bad habit of uh, uh, using my own system so this is the ip for this ubuntu system and i'm going to go ahead and ssh it into the system so that it's easy for me all right now what i need to do is i need to uh, so i've set up a demo and here i'm just going to go ahead and go to the demo poc and here if you see that there are scripts which are there like poc.py, task.py, and uh, conf.py. Now, these scripts, Python scripts, are interlinked. And here, I'm going to be going, uh, I'm going to be executing remote code execution. So before that, let me go ahead and enable the environment. Uh, so the basic environment that I'm using here is environment two, because I have multiple things set up on this demo. So I'm going to be using environment two and I'm going to be activating. And here I'm using Python three. So Python three is vulnerable to it. Now, while I talk about that, the important thing to remember is that um, here, after setting up Linux environment, I'm using MongoDB. And in MongoDB, I've created a database called Celery and collection within the database called Celery call and using Python 3. This is the basic environment that I'm using. And for Celery version, I'm using 5.2.1. Now, because that's the vulnerable version, if I don't specify and you're trying on something else, you will not be able to use it. So, right, Mo MongoDB is running. Now, environment is activated. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and enable the task worker, Celery task worker. So here, I'm going to go ahead and enable it. So if you see salary task worker is up and running. Now let me go ahead and open a new tab. Now let me zoom a bit. Okay. Let me go ahead and SSH into it. Now oh, I saw fact, that log for sure. <laughs> oh, that's my favorite. I, I keep demoing <laughs> it at every place that you can think of. Like I totally love that. And I think we both uh, love these RC bugs, right? I mean, yeah, I love it a scary way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So here, I'm going to go ahead and demo PLC. I'm going to go ahead and. Oh, okay. Now, while salary is running, I am. I need to do one thing. I need to run my Python script, which is there. Let me go ahead and show you. So I'm going to be running poc.py. So let me run this attack first, and then let me show you what exactly is in poc.py. That was literally, you literally just read my mind then as a dev. I was just like, I wonder what's in that file. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> See, that's why we say that you and I are the both best combination, dev and security. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not it's fighting. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's not oh, my I code? No, I'm joking. <laughs> I hope it works. I hope it works. I hope it works. And if it doesn't work, Me I have too. the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the video. Because um, that's something very crazy sometimes when, when you don't have that. Uh, okay, let me go ahead and... Okay, let me just get while it is. Let me see if it's working or not. Oh no, it's taking a lot of time. Mm. Come in, see, come in, see. Yeah, I'm just thinking if it's gonna work or not. But no, issues. maybe this is a vulnerability. Vulnerability. <laughs> yeah, let me go ahead and get my video. Yeah, that happens, and I tested it just before this call. I'm like, yeah. it should work. It should work. It's it should work. But demo gods, you never you know. You jinxed it. Yep. Yeah. So this demo POC is, yeah. 
<laughs> I jinxed it. Yes, that's right. So, so I have a habit of all this um, activating. Now, we are using Python 3, enabling Celery Task Worker. Now, when Task Worker is running, I, I go ahead, uh, after that, run the POC, poc.py script. Now, here, if you see, that's what I run, poc.py. The task is running, and it gives me a task ID. Now, I'm going to pick up the task ID. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be going ahead and managing that or adding it, modifying the task ID. Now, once the task ID is modified, if you see the metadata ha has been set up with that. And another important aspect that I, after modifying, I actually try to get information using that task ID because that's set up in the metadata. And now when I fetch that, you see that I am getting the UID to GID to anything that's there. So now it's the simplest one that you can think of. But if I get any other any further information, right? Here I've just got this information like UID, group ID, and whatnot. Like this is the most juicy information that I can get from a Linux system. Yeah. It's I interesting that it comes back as a as a fail. Like it's like yeah. here's all the information. Failure. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's a failure, all right. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair error. Any which way, you're giving me all the information that I want, and I am able to do the remote code execution just setting the simple task ID that I've got from my POC. Now, let me go ahead and run this POC.py or show you what it is so that it's easy for us to grasp what it is. Now, so this dual monitors are ready. Okay, so here, this is a simple script where oh. I'm uh, I'm fetching some information. Can you see it? Yeah, just make it a little bit. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Thank yeah. You. Uh, remove the document yeah. message. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> right. So here, if you see this, I'm using. Uh, so I'm, I'm. I'm getting some task. I'm adding some conf. I'm gonna be. I want some information around host, port, DB, and call, and salary POC. I've defined like what exactly we need to do. First, we need to install Celery PyMongo, then run the task worker and get the task ID from the backend. Now, if I can modify the backend task data, like I did the task ID, I can manipulate anything. So here I have defined it, what to do, what not to do when the task is running, and fetch the ID or print what it is. Now here, if you see if the collection find one data, status failure, result, dump, just dump the data. And what data? OS, system, ID. I want every information from the database. And yeah. if I get that information, what else I can do? I can just print it in any place. I can use it for my own benefit, right? This seems simple, yeah. but it took me days to understand this, uh, to replicate this, right? And I can fetch task ID or this seems normal but then if I want to get some more information modify the data modify the admin data how cool that would be so everyone update salary 5.2.1 for the best of the use it's very very important and I hope it was explanatory or best is I'm going to go ahead and give you something important the blog that's been written by the team so that you can go back and refer to the blog and the video that we have for salary. Because that's the fun one. That's a good one where I've explained it in detail. I was considerate about time here because we are over time. And it's Steve and I can talk for hours, days together. So you can think of it that um, we can talk about these vulnerabilities at any given point of time, at any day. and. Um, just play around with that. So amazing. Thank you. Also, I'm just gonna say now I'm glad you had the backup handy. Because I didn't have backup video handy. <laughs> but um no, always good to always good to have backups, always have always have those redundancies in place and check them and make sure they're secure and safe as well. But um no, thank you for that. That was um yeah, that was really interesting. Um I've used Mongo before for projects and yeah, making sure it's nice and secure. Actually, that's probably a blog post in right there as well. 
Um, but yeah, check out the check out the blog post and the video in the chat or that's on the screen right now. Also, yeah, that is all we have time for for this episode. Uh, we are actually switching to weekly for the for the, uh, in April as well for these. So if you do, um, if you have been enjoying the series, please let us know. Join us on Discord. I'll put the link in the chat as well because uh, we always love um, chatting about our findings. But then also, like, if there's one, if there's a particular vulnerability type you've dealt with in the past or that you've um, had some issues with, then please let us know, and we'd um, we'd love to cover it on the show. We'd actually be open to having guests on as well. So, if you wanted to come on, uh, please reach out and let us know. If you missed our last episode, it is recorded on the Sneak uh, YouTube or Twitch, so please check that out as well. And I think that's all we had time for for this episode. So, um, yeah. Uh, any Hello. final words, Bendana? Hi. Ta-da! Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you all for joining us. Um, please reach out. And also, just lastly, remember the DevSecon24 CFP is now open. So please check that out as well. So until next time, uh, we will see you soon. Absolutely. And. <laughs> <laughs>